Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're at the trickling in stage. This is Don Hinkle Brown, the president and CEO of the Reinvestment Fund. Um, and Jeremy Nowak's uh, successor as CEO. Um, welcome to the sixth annual um, Jeremy Nowak Memorial Lecture. Um, when Jeremy passed, the board of directors at the Reinvestment Fund and senior staff thought it important to create something that would honor, commemorate, and practice uh, some of what uh, Jeremy believed and uh, his principles and his method. Um, and uh, a lecture and a panel discussion uh, is very much um, in that vein. At the same time, Penn IUR was looking to honor Jeremy, who had served for several years in the department and had been an instructor at Penn's Urban Studies program. Together, uh, we created this lecture and panel series. This year is a panel. Some years it's been more lecture. Uh, and uh, we've been pleased to have some of the people that work so closely with him involved. Uh, uh, this year, Della Clark, <clears throat> myself, and Mark Pinsky. Um, but in prior years, uh, George McCarthy, uh, who had been at the Ford Foundation, um, Mark Stern, who um, at uh, SIAP uh, worked with us on uh, you know, uh, the social fabric building of community arts, and Bruce Katz, a longtime collaborator uh, with Jeremy. Um, in short, uh, Penn and the Reinvestment Fund work together each year to create a lecture that speaks to Jeremy's vision about organized people, organized capital, and organized data and ideas that are the keys to building wealth and economic opportunity for people and places that have historically been uh, disadvantaged. So uh, this year, uh, we have with us uh, Della Clark, the president of the Enterprise Center and a partner in Innovate Capital Growth Fund. We have Jody Harris, the new president of PIDC and previously being the longtime director of the CDFI Fund at U.S. Treasury. We have Mike Tamale, the CEO of Build From Within America. Um, and we have myself, um, Don Nicole Brown. We will be moderated by Mark Pinsky, um, and uh, Mark uh, led OFN for many, many years and today um, uh, leads the seeding of places for CDFI work through uh, CDFI Friendly America. Um, we will have a Q&A process, not in the chat, uh, but there'll be a place to uh, send your Q&A and Ira will um, send them off to us speakers. Um, we also have on our panel, um, or our welcoming talk, Karen Fegley, the Deputy Commerce Director, in lieu of the mayor who uh, was pulled away today. Uh, and she works in the Office of Policy and Strategic Initiatives. Was that my cue, Don? I think that is. Sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We're... Great, great, great. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here today. Um, you know, good afternoon. And thank you to the Reinvestment Fund and the Penn Institute for Urban Research for the invitation to speak. Um, I, as you heard, am pinch hitting today for our great mayor, Sherelle Parker. Um, very proud to join you. Uh, she had a conflict and simply couldn't join today. Um, it was a, a last minute thing. And again, um, I'm proud to speak on her behalf and, and happy to be here. It's great to be alongside some of our country's great community development finance leaders. Um, I can give you an overview of our economic opportunity agenda in the Parker administration, which was talked about yesterday at a celebration marking our uh, mayor's 100th day in office. Uh, the economic opportunity section was uh, that went out to the press had more initiatives than any other section, and that was no accident to address the significant and growing economic disparities facing our city, we know that we need to move on multiple fronts. Uh, so we have to make it easier to start and grow businesses. We need to support diverse entrepreneurs and increase their access to capital. Um, also need to expand access to good jobs, paying family sustaining wages, and we need to support our neighbors who face unique barriers to economic opportunity. So the mayor's action plan laid down markers in each of these areas. Um, and I'm happy to give a brief update on the work underway um, and then talk a little bit about how, how 
CDFIs are going to play a role in all of this. So um, the mayor often says regulatory re regulatory burdens impose a time tax on our local businesses, diverting resources and attention away from hiring that next employee or opening that next location. And so based on feedback from our local business community, we know everything we can do to reduce the cost and complexity businesses face when navigating local government can help spur additional economic growth. And that's why I'm thrilled that the mayor included a PHL Open for Business initiative in her action plan. Through this work, we're aiming to create a best-in-class client service experience to help businesses start, grow, relocate to, and remain in Philadelphia. And we'll be pursuing multiple strategies, including removing unnecessary regulatory steps, streamlining processes, accelerating approval timelines, and offering trusted guidance, advocacy resources, and targeted investments that help businesses thrive. Our work's going to be grounded in the experience of our clients, local entrepreneurs and businesses, and informed by the insights of our frontline colleagues, frontline colleagues in the city, as well as all of our partners, um, our business support organizations that we work with. We know the best solutions to problems come from the folks who are most proximate to them. Uh, one of the mayor's priorities coming into office was to establish an office of minority business success to bolster minority businesses in Philadelphia, creating a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem and connecting diverse businesses to opportunity. So the mayor has uh, hired a tremendous leader for this work, um, Rachel Branson, who is establishing the minority uh, the minority Office of Minority Business Services, apologize, as a trusted resource to help answer questions, um, field concerns, and make connections within and outside city government. So she and her team are also breaking down silos and working across sectors to remove barriers and expand opportunity. She's also going to be working with PIDC it's here today to create a fund with flexible underwriting standards for early stage and small minority businesses. Um, in the meantime, the mayor has committed for um, us to partner on monitoring $2 million in upcoming city investments to two local funds, Innovate Capital Fund, um, with Della Clark, who's here today, and the Philadelphia Accelerator Fund. Both support local minority businesses and help them scale. Um, we're going to have a business, well, a, a number of business roundtables, including one that is an equitable capital table, and that will be chaired by a local banking executive, but it will convene local and national investors who commit to supporting local diverse businesses with capital investments. Um, the mayor has been crystal clear about the importance of workforce development and connecting people to quality jobs. And that's why one of her first official acts was to sign an executive order to remove barriers to city employment. The mayor also knows some of our neighbors face, face additional barriers to economic opportunity. So we are, exciting work is underway to open neighborhood resource centers, one-stop shops for connecting our returning citizens with services and supports. Our foreign born neighbors also often face significant barriers. And so the mayor is committed to seeking renewal of the city's certification as a welcoming city for immigrants. We know the city will truly thrive and all cities will truly thrive when we build equitable economies that fully leverage the talent and potential found in every neighborhood across our city. This year's NOAC Memorial Lecture focused on economic opportunity for everyone and exploring how community development financial institutions can support that key goal is a vehicle for that vision. And by having some of the nation's great community development finance leaders here to discuss how their tools can advance economic opportunity. I want to note that Mayor Parker has long been a staunch supporter of CDFIs and the many roles that they play in lifting up communities and neighborhoods in Philadelphia and across the country. In 2020, then Council Member Parker signed on to a letter to the U.S. Treasury Secretary Munchen stating that CDFIs are a vital lifeline to the many small businesses and that we urge the inclusion of certified community development financial institutions as eligible lenders under Section 1109 of the CARES Act. The mayor is well aware that CDFIs ensure access to credit for impacted businesses, nonprofits, healthcare facilities, and individuals in low wealth communities. In Philadelphia, small businesses that access capital through CDFIs help revitalize communities, grow the local economy, and create jobs and build wealth for those who are trying to grab the first rung of the economic ladder. The Philadelphia Commerce Department has always enjoyed a strong partnership with CDFIs. It was strengthened during the pandemic when we had to meet on a weekly basis, and we coordinated gr relief grant programs 
Uh, then Council Member Parker supported city funds going to the PA CDFI network so that the CDFIs could help the businesses that they know and serve. All of the local CDFIs are active participants in um, a program we have called the Philadelphia Business Lending Network. And um, all of them helped create the Commerce, help the Commerce Department to create and fund the incentive grant. Since the Lending Network Incentive Grant launched in late 2022, Commerce, the city has provided $1 million in grants to 50 micro businesses owned by historically disadvantaged individuals. And in doing so, that made them eligible or vice versa. They were eligible for the loans, which allowed them to be eligible for the grants. So they got matching loans and matching grants to build their credit and capacity. We're really excited about that innovative program. In addition to financing, Commerce is committed to providing coaching. We fund CDFIs and other business support organizations to provide technical assistance and training, including implementation of the fantastic build from within model that Mihailo created. Mayor Parker and this administration strongly supports the work of CDFIs in our city, and we look forward to partnering with many of you on work to increase access to economic opportunity for all in the weeks, months, and years to come. Thanks so much. Thank you, Karen. Um, next um, on our run of show, which I have to find, um, <clears throat> uh, Susan Walkner could not be with us today for technical reasons. Uh, she is uh, probably watching, but unable to fully connect. Um, so um, we would ask Karen to answer the question we had for the mayor, which was, um, well, your speech kind of did that, but um, we're here to discuss how the city's vision and the mayor's vision for economic opportunity for everyone can connect with the work of CDFIs. Um, so we're going to introduce now Mark Pinsky, who will moderate us as a group to have that as the overall arching question. And uh, he has some specific questions for us. Uh, thank you, Don. Um, thank you, Karen. I'm grateful to be part today of the uh, Jeremy Nowak Lecture Series. And first off, I want to take a moment to recognize Jessica Nowak, who's here with us today to honor her father and her family. Um, it means a lot to us that you're here with us, Jess. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, Karen, for your inspiring comments on behalf of our mayor. Um, you and, as you noted, you and the mayor have worked with CDFIs for a long time. I want to take just a minute on behalf of the, the others who are in the, in the audience with us to say a few things to just sort of uh, frame out CDFIs so that we know what we're talking about here. Um, and so very briefly, um, CDFIs are private, public purpose financial institutions that work with a business model that is profitable or aims to be profitable, but is not profit maximizing so that it can turn some of its revenue back into support for its borrowers and its customers. Um, there are in the United States today about 1,500 CDFIs in 50 states. Um, they provide financing for small businesses, for affordable housing of all types, for commercial real estate, for nonprofits, facilities and operations, and for consumers from everything from used car loans to mortgages. Um, they work in urban, rural, and native communities across uh, the United States. And according to a recent report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, they manage today about $450 billion, um, which is a long way from um, when uh, Jeremy started the reinvestment fund. Um, and just for a few things to sort of localize this a little bit, um, our data is that uh, CDFIs have, have invested and loaned more than a billion dollars, well over a billion dollars um, from uh, about a dozen CDFIs in Philadelphia um, over the last 40 or so years. Um, notably, 74% of that financing has gone to BIPOC borrowers, um, as, it, as we would hope it would be focused. And just to put that in a little context from the state, that's more than half of all CDFI financing that's been done in Pennsylvania in the history of CDFIs. Um, so Philadelphia is, um, is well served by its CDFIs, but still there's obviously um, so much more to do. And so Karen, I would just start with a question to you on behalf of the mayor is um, what, 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 what does the mayor see um, CDFIs doing to advance her vision for the city and all of the things that you outlined? What, what, what would you like to see from the CDFIs? We'll have a chance to respond later, but we'll give you a chance now to answer. Okay, great, thanks. 
Um, yeah, the, the mayor is really, I mean, economic opportunity for all is, 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 you know, it's the mission that we are, it's the line we are all saying every day, all day to ourselves. And, uh, and, and it's a real commitment. And so we know that we have to be holistic in our approach. I mean, the mayor, the mayor fully recognizes that, but creating opportunities for businesses is, is something she is very uh, committed to and also committed to these partnerships. We know it's not something the city can do, right? We need the partnerships of CDFIs. We need, um, uh, frankly, just because of who you are and and where like your positioning in the communities, that's necessary. Um, and um, and also in those relationships you have with businesses, um, as well as the experience and knowledge. Um, you know, the mayor knows that CDFIs are the experts on um, on the services that businesses need, on the 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 building up, the capacity building that's necessary. Um, in order to get to capital, right? We know capital isn't always like step number one. Often there's a lot of work and handholding that goes into all of your efforts before you can actually make that loan. And so there's a commitment to that. Um, the Commerce Department, like I said, we've, we've been funding this sort of work. The mayor is certainly looking at how to continue and expand and leverage it, I think, as much as possible. I think that's one of the key things, right? How do we uh, make sure that, that our investments are complemented and leveraged for the most impact. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had there. It's It's been now 101 days, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> right. and um, we, you know, we can at least give you the, the next 100 days as we work on sort of how we can work together um, to, to do more for the city. Um, and I just wondered if there's anything else that's in the longer term plans for what the city might do to involve CDFIs or, you know, should we be bringing those ideas to you? You know, how, what what can the city do that that um, you know is thinking about doing? The mayor's thinking about doing that would uh, help CDFIs do more for all those reasons you you've already held. Right. Well, you should always bring ideas to us, right? We always want to get ideas fed from the the folks that are doing the work. Um, but but one of the things that's coming up again, I talked about the Open for Business initiative. That doesn't directly impact the CDFIs work, except like I said, I, I know it does because I know that everyone struggled in supporting a business going through the system of, you know, the bureaucracy and the red tape that comes with doing business. And so if we can make that part easier, I hope that that will make everyone's job easier. But the other um, project we're working on right now is um, building a business resource, an online business resource hub. Uh, many, there are many cities have this. Um, Philadelphia has a, a version of it on our Philadelphia website, but it's something that, that has uh, also developed um, in our communications and our regular conversations with CDFIs and other business service organizations that we need something that businesses can navigate, you know, it'll be online 24 seven, 365, where they can navigate and find access the services, whether it's technical assistance and training or whether it's um, getting that loan that they need and, and access that from the micro enterprises as they grow. I mean, one of the things I think we're all in agreement we need to focus on is helping businesses grow. We need to get them from here to here. And there's a lot of steps in between and there's the, necess the necessity for a lot of partnerships in there, you know, a lot of different players to kind of help and support that growth. Thank you. One one last question for you, if I can, uh, that came in actually from our from our audience. So we, we wanna, we wanna encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A and, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. But one of the questions that came in uh, was related to the, the, the uh, sports arena that's being discussed on Market Street. And um, I know that there's a lot going on with that. CDFIs care a lot about the communities, as does the mayor. And so, we, you know, we're together in that. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we do worry about the impact of, of uh, economic and cultural displacement that's being discussed, obviously. And um, I just wonder if you could, you could help us understand a little bit about what the process is going forward um, around the, the, proposed, uh, the proposed arena and um, be, not not specifically CDFIs, but I, but I think it'd be helpful for everybody to know that. Uh, sure. Um, I we are we are looking at we're doing some looking at some studies right now. Well, well, there's studies underway. We're looking at the pieces we have and waiting for some more, some more impact or more of, of the final study so that we can really evaluate the impact of a sports arena in that um, in that location. Um, 
you know, we're fully open to all possibilities. I'm going to say I'm not fully prepared to talk about the arena in itself. But what I can say is there is a commitment, like I said, to small businesses, to being a welcoming city that allows um, new immigrants, new Philadelphians to continue to start businesses. Um, so we are exploring other kinds of um, incentives, arena or not, put the arena away just in general. Um, I know a lot of cities have programs for legacy businesses. Um, we don't have that specifically here in Philadelphia. And one of the things we're looking at is we don't just want to support the legacy business. Again, we want to create an environment that is continually open and available to new businesses, right? To the legacy businesses of tomorrow. So um, so we are definitely looking at evaluating the resources we already provide to the small business community and looking at if we need to target those to specific um you know, cultural destinations, historic destinations, areas that um, that are certainly, you know, attractions and part of what makes our our city a great place. And we, we want to preserve those. Thanks, Karen. The um, I, I had planned for the panel later to have a lightning round at the end to let them sort of couple answer a couple questions. I'm going to do a quick lightning round with you because we have maybe a minute. Um, OK. So um, the, the first question that came in was uh, was uh, whether the mayor has a perspective on the universal basic income strategy and whether that has any role actively in her economic development program. Just a quick response. I know that um, we have, uh, we are uh, supportive of the city, our city council is, is has a committee to um, a task force to look at uh, reparations and what that would mean in Philadelphia. Um, we're definitely supportive of, yes, raising our, our minimum wage uh, here in Pennsylvania. Um, we are one of the lowest minimum wages and um, recognize that there's there's a need to increase that. Great. That's welcome. Um, last last lightning round question for you, Karen. Um, the, the mayor relied and brought together business roundtables during the transition period. And um, just wonder about the role of them going forward and whether that whether there's a role for CDFIs within that or a role for a CDFI roundtable for that matter. So. Yes, absolutely. Um, as I said, there is going to be a capital access roundtable. Uh, the members are still being put together. We have, um, I, I have from the Commerce seat, um, uh, made sure that the mayor's office is aware that we have our convening of the business lending network, which is not just CDFIs, it's also other lenders, and that we also meet regularly. We're, we're lucky to have the PA CDFI network that brings together all the Pennsylvania CDFIs and, and obviously all the Philadelphia CDFIs. So um, we have multiple convenings of that, and I'm positive that some of that is going to intersect with the mayor's roundtables. Great. Thank you for being here. Um, we we, we, so miss, we miss Mayor Parker. We appreciate her trying to be here and we look forward. I, to I know she she really wishes. I know she wishes she could have been here and I'll make sure to, to share this. So thanks. All right. We'll, we'll be here for the next conversation. So that's good. Thank you, Karen. Don, I think are you coming back on? Or are we just rolling right into the panel? I'm going to guess we're rolling right into the panel. All right. If the um, if our if our panelists want to join me on uh, on camera, that would be great. Oh. Wonderful. And um, we'll get to introductions in just just one second. You've you've heard who they are. We'll talk a little bit more about them. We'll give them a chance to talk about their organizations and in more detail the work that they're doing. Um, I want to I want to just take a moment to say that when we talk about CDFIs, it's not really possible to overstate Jeremy's. Um, important role in creating the CDFI industry as we know it today. Um, we know that he started the reinvestment fund. We he made it into a force not only in Philadelphia but but nationwide. Um, and uh, that Don and his team, you know, carry that forward. And we honor that today as we as we come together. Um, but not everybody really knows um, the role Jeremy played um, nationally. And in fact, I think even those of us who are who are friends with Jeremy and and involved in the industry didn't really know until we lost Jeremy how wide and deep his impact was on this country and on CDFIs. Um, he he worked directly with hundreds of CDFIs in his years in the industry. Um, he, he talked with, he helped, he assisted, he supported thousands of practitioners. Um, and he played a long list of critical roles at the industry level in making us into the industry today that punches way above its weight. And I just want to share one quick story that came to mind as, we were, as I was preparing this morning, which is that when the when uh, President Clinton first proposed the CDFI fund 
Um, the Senate Banking Committee decided it was going to have a hearing on the proposal for to create what's now the CDFI fund. Um, and everybody in the CDFI industry had a discussion about, since we knew we'd get an invitation to testify, about who should testify. And there were lots of reasons for lots of people to testify. When we sat down with the, the uh, Senate Banking Committee staff, they said, they said, don't think of this as an honor. Think of this as a little bit of a street fight because um, our biggest challenge is gonna come from Senator Al D'Amato, who's the ranking Republican on the committee, who really is out to sort of um, um, you know, challenge and undo this, the, um, the, um, the, the, the notion of there ever being a CDFI fund. And so we really need somebody who can go toe to toe with, with um, Senator D'Amato and still be you know, calm, cool and collected and uh, can explain the whole industry. And we all looked around at each other and everybody said together, that's Jeremy. Um, and at the actual hearing, Senator D'Amato came out with a with a you know with blasting his argument, and it, it really took Jeremy no more than two or three minutes to not only to calm him down but to win him over. Um, and um, you know that was a critical moment. The CDFI fund could have been um, taken off its course uh, before it even really got started. So, um, but at last of all, on a personal level, I, Jeremy profoundly influenced each of us who are on the panel today, and you'll hear a little bit about that perhaps. But I think that in turn, each of our panelists, um, um, Della, Jody, Mike, and Don, have transformed their organizations and the communities that they exist to serve for the better. Um, so um, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over um, as we as we get into our uh, conversation. I'm going to turn it over to the panelists um, and ask them. And we'll start with you, Della, and then Jody, and then Mike, and Don. Um, we're going to ask you to introduce yourselves, but really what I want you to do is explain what your organization does and how you think about that challenge of how do you create economic opportunity for everyone. Della? Thank you. And I'm delighted to be part of this NOAA um, lecture series today. And I want to start out by saying that the one DNA that Jeremy had that I inherited from him was being a disruptor right? As I think about Jeremy, he definitely was a disruptor. And that's what I respected and liked about him the most. The second thing is, is that he started a, uh, a venture fund. And I was on that board. And at the time, I didn't know anything about funds or venture. But that's where my lingo began to be shaped and my vision. And so today, the Enterprise Center has a fund. And I give that tribute and honor to Jeremy because he laid that found work for me. Um, the second thing that I want to share with everyone is that I, I joined the Enterprise Center 32 years ago. It's a 34-year organization. And we started out with a program mentality. But today, 34 years later, we're focused on capital. Because while CDFIs have played a major role in the Enterprise Center and, and, and putting out capital on the street, that we did bring some harm to our client's balance sheet. And, and so the rest of my discussion, Mark, and the rest of the panel is, is really from the lenses of our client. Um, I've seen over the years that our client's balance sheet, they become a hamster wheel of debt. And partly because that we were so busy caught up in the numbers, how many loans that you do on a monthly basis, how many you do on a quarterly basis, what's the impact, how many jobs, that we became more focused on our own balance sheet and the data and less about our clients. And so today we're focused on changing the narrative, right? Such words as technical assistance. We wanna put that in the graveyard and call it business support services. Uh, we wanna put in the graveyard, just me. Oftentimes we would ask clients who's on your management team or who's part of your organization. They would say, just me. We want to change that, that um, narrative and help our clients build management team as an example. Um, we now understand the difference between underserved and low wealth. And so clients who come from low wealth communities, their parents do not own the boots and the strap. So if you tell someone whose family don't have any equity, tell them to bootstrap it, they're not able to. And so they end up getting loans and they get debt. And over time, they're never able to cover that whole up. And so what we have learned with our equity fund is that equity really gives clients a vote of confidence. Whereas when you think about debt, it's really to meet a condition of that business. And so as I began to work with our small businesses, they have no idea about their capital stack. They have no idea about their balance sheet and what EBITDA means and retain earning means. And so today we are converting the enterprise center into a capital and investment center. And it's working on a new strategic plan 
that will begin to move us that, in that direction. So in closing, we're going less on programs that we often internally use the word programs to really becoming a capital investment center and becoming that beacon on the balance sheet so that we can get our clients to focus on that and less about chasing contracts, but more about building business infrastructure. So as I think about the enterprise center CDFI in the future, um, we really are going to help our clients build a financial strategy, help them with pitch deck, investor decks, and help them understand how you need both debt and equity. Because as a capital landscape, it is not just about debt and it's not just about equity, but how do you put both of them together to build your company and grow? So that's where we're focused on today. That's, that's awesome, Della. Thank you. you you've, been, you've been at this for a long time and you've, you've had an incredible ride. Um, it's exciting to hear where you're going. Um, Jody, um, your screen tells us that you're driving growth to every corner of Philadelphia. Talk to us a little bit more about what PIDC is doing and how you think about economic opportunity for all. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for the invitation to participate on this panel today. I am the new-ish president of PIDC. I came on board in June 2023, and that was after being the CDFI fund director for a number of years and working within the Department of the Treasury on various CDFI issues in different capacities. And I have to say that being invited to participate on this panel is truly an honor. Um, the, the panelists I am joined by have been names that I have known and worked with over the years, and they really laid the groundwork in Philadelphia for CDFI. So again, thank you for the invitation. PIDC is a long-standing public-private partnership with the city. Uh, we are an economic development partner, and we drive growth in Philadelphia in three primary ways. One, as that city partner, we are the fiscal agent and conduit partner for a number of programs and actions that the city wants to take to support economic development. So we work hand in hand with the Commerce Department. Karen Fegley is someone that we work closely with, as well as the mayor's administration to shape their economic development agenda. The other way we work in the city is by managing transactions on behalf of the city when it comes to the industrial land bank. We also facilitate large development projects across the city. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Navy Yards, one of the largest developments that PIDC has been managing and is planning development for the past 20 years and for the next 20 years. But the part of PIDC that I'll focus on today is PIDC Community Capital, which is our CDFI. And our CDFI has been in existence for about 12 years. We started off as a CDE working with New Markets Tax Credits, and we've grown to develop a suite of products and services, as well as targeted business support for small businesses across the Philadelphia landscape. So again, thank you for having me, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Jody. And I, I realize that as uh, the former director of the CDFI fund, you may have had another whole set of relationships with Jeremy. I don't know if you overlapped, but um, that, that's another conversation, but for another time. So. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Mike Tamale. Mike uh, is uh, now the director and CEO of Build From Within America, a national effort to take some of the lessons he and he's learned in his work uh, in St. Paul over many years with uh, the, the experience and the innovation of others. So Mike, tell us a little bit about Build, with, build uh, from within. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, being here, and it's an honor, especially being the only uh, non-Philadelphia guy on this uh, panel. Uh, great to be with you. You have an amazing city um, and an amazing community development scene. So it's genuinely an honor for me. Uh, I've been doing the same 32 years that Della has, um, uh, almost to the day, I guess. Um, but what we what we came from at uh, Built from Within Alliance has really sprung from. Uh, our experience uh, with an with a organization called the Neighborhood Development Center in the Twin Cities, which starts not from a CDFI perspective, but starts with a neighborhood perspective. We start with neighborhood folks. We really came out of the community development corporation scene, the, com the commercial corridor uh, revitalization scene, the uh, areas of real concentrated poverty in our city, mostly communities of color. Uh, and efforts that we had for years to try to revitalize those, um, uh, I guess, by looking outside of our community, trying to bring in businesses um, into our uh, vacant spaces, et cetera. Well, we figured out uh, 32 years ago 
was that our neighborhoods actually abounded with uh, entrepreneurial talent, but trying to reach those folks, trying to actually respect them enough to want to reach them, um, took a different approach. And so starting back then, we, we uh, created uh, whole networks of neighborhood partnerships. Uh, it could be neighborhood groups, it could be churches, it could be ethnic uh, groups, women's groups, whatever, that had the trust of the people we're trying to reach. Um, and then started walking along the side of those folks that wanted to start a business that already had a business underground and maybe had a business above ground, but needed all kinds of uh, supports and help uh, to get on the first rung of the ladder uh, before they could even launch their business or uh, stabilize it enough to move up to the second or third rung uh, and be uh, eligible for CDFI funding. Uh, Neighbor Development Center is a CDFI, but that's just one of the tools in this sort of package uh, where we're trying to respect the uh, the actual experience of each of our customers, which are these low-income uh, folks that either are entrepreneurs or want to become entrepreneurs. Um, over the 32 years, Neighbor Development Center has trained like 7,000 people out in their own communities and small groups uh, to start a to start a business. We've financed over a thousand of them. Um, uh, at any one time, we have about 20% of them actually open in business, and on average, they're staying in business for, for 10 years, um, obviously employing their neighbors, being role models, et cetera. So the Build, the build From Within Alliance um, is a, a slowly growing uh, set of community-based organizations around the country that have been interested in adopting and adapting that model uh, in different ways, including a, a number of groups in Philadelphia, the Welcoming Center, uh, neighbor Progress uh, Fund and uh, Greenland Capital Access, um, all supported by uh, your Commerce Department, supported by your Merchants Fund, uh, research and evaluation done by uh, our very own Ira Goldstein and the Reinvestment Fund. So the, the uh, connection into Philly is really powerful. Also down the road in Wilmington, Delaware, the West End Neighborhood House has been taking this model uh, into all their own communities. Obviously it's earlier, it's way on the bottom of, of the economic ladder, but we're moving people up. It's the same ladder um, that Dell is talking about with equity. It's the same ladder everybody's talking about here. But the idea is to try to refocus as many of the folks coming through that um, uh, system and up that ladder back into their own neighborhoods whenever possible to start you know, really uh, rebuilding their economies from within is what we call it. So I'll quit there, uh, Mark, thanks. It's great, Mike. It's, it's great to have perspective from other places um, and we all do that in the CDFI industry. There's a lot of there's a lot of connection to other folks doing innovative things and important things in other areas. So um, I just want to know, please keep, keep your questions coming in the Q and A. We will get to them in a little bit. We want to give the panelists a chance to um, introduce themselves and, um, and and their organizations. Don, can you tell us about Reinvestment Fund? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, well. I probably have to say a little bit less if everyone's here because there's some attachments to Jeremy Nowak. Um, you know, we, uh, our original business model was the premise that he as a community organizer could move on from having organized people to start to organize capital. And we quickly learned that you also had to organize capacity. Um, hence, our, one of our early affiliates did that uh, technical assistance and community planning function. And then we moved on to realizing that you also had to uh, organize data to make wise decisions and to make your pitch to local government or state government about why they should support this work. You had to have the data, both to evidence the need, but also to evidence the impact. So we've continued with that business model. Um, you know, our prime business unit organizes the capital. Um, Ira founded our team, which organizes data and does analytics for clients and studies both the problems that they face, but also the impacts of their programs and their initiatives. Uh, we continue to partner with organized people um, in, in a host of ways. Um, and we have just recently started a fairly new business unit, which is where we're returning to organizing capacity uh, in, right now in the space of uh, food access, uh, early child care and social determinants of health. Um, as a CDFI, uh, we had the blessings of growing up under Jeremy's leadership. He was really one of the champions 
that CDFIs needed to be funded based on having a sustainable business model. And in the early days at the U.S. Treasury, those fundings were really mini business plans, right? They weren't so mini, actually. They were quite involved. And, um, and that survives today. You can still see the fingerprints on the FA program around uh, business function, business feasibility, and sustainability. As a larger loan fund now serving most of Eastern US and many programs going nationwide, um, we have had the luxury of being able to de-emphasize our kind of hyper-focus on our own sustainability. You know, much of our industry creates programs and products with this heavy lens on can we afford to do this? And are we going to make money doing this? Um, and uh, growing past that, one can then start being effectively a domestic policy partner to state, local, and federal government. And that's really where I think the sweet spot is for CDFIs, is to be implementation partners for new de domestic policy ideas. We've seen this happen in a number of ways. And with the reinvestment fund, the best example is our fresh food financing. We help define the problem. We help define and construct a programmatic response. And now today we run a nationwide program for the USDA in that space. Um, a, a very rare instance of USDA outsourcing um, a program. Like Della, we have also traveled along and kind of gotten tired of the road of debt as only tool. Um, and there are such limitations to debt as uh, the only tool that you have. We made a foray into private equity. It did not have the right attachments to the rest of our work in terms of uh, impact on underserved populations. Uh, but we're returning to that as it relates to uh, black and brown developers and we'll be launching this year an equity product for developers. Um, that's new for us again, but um, it's really important because we've just seen the limitations of stacking more debt on an equity light balance sheet doesn't really work. It only works if we accept it, but then it doesn't help those developers access additional resources because others may not buy into that level of leverage. Um, we, um, <clears throat> um, I think I'll stop it there so we can get to others and Q&A, but the reinvestment fund is um, thrilled to be here with these partners. Uh, we have worked with all of them in some fashion or copied them in some fashion or benefited from their work in some fashion. And it's thrilled. I'm thrilled that you're all here uh, to remember Jeremy's work and to talk with us about the road forward. Um, thank you, Don. Um, so let's get let's get back to the mayor's comments or Karen's comments on behalf of the mayor. Um, you know, the, the general the general question here is what's your response? But the, the more specific question is, is um, you know what do you see in that that's that where you think CDFIs need to be involved or where are priorities for you and what you can do um, and how are you how are you going to respond to this or this so um, maybe we'll start um, with Jody if you're willing. Thanks, Mark. As the city's partner on a lot of initiatives that are targeted to small businesses, I think one of the things that is very important is being able to see CDFIs, as, as Don said, an implementation partner. Um, we have flexibility, we have know-how, we have access to resources that can complement the resources that the city uh, puts forth for these initiatives. I also think one of the things to recognize in, with CDFIs in terms of working with the mayor's agenda is that flexibility and there is enough room for all of us on this call, as well as the others that are in the PA CDFI network to help support that. The need is great enough and we all have different strengths where we can play a part. And so in thinking about all of the capital that's been mentioned in that kind of debt to equity spectrum, there's a role for all of us in supporting small businesses across the city. And I'm encouraged that the mayor is seeing CDFIs as one of the tools, uh, one of the implementation partners, one of the ways to reach out to the small businesses. Having trouble getting to my microphone. Della? Well, I think we have two of the largest CDFIs in Philadelphia on this panel, which is uh, 
the reinvestment fund and PIDC. I have to be honest and say there is a capacity gap for many of the CDFIs in Philadelphia. So as we think about supporting the mayor's work, we have to be candid and say many of the smaller CDFIs balance sheet look like the clients they're trying to serve. And so I think we need to change the narrative here and begin to build capacity of our CDFIs so that they can play a more implementation role in terms of the vision of the city. Because right now there is some significant weaknesses in, in the capacity of the smaller CDFIs. And so I think that needs to be part of the dialogue and conversation is how do we help build their balance sheet? Because right now cost of capital is high. And so to go and get capital from banks now, you're not gonna get it at the same rate that you might have received when the CDFIs first started back under the Clinton administration. So it's, it's doing a paradigm shift with the inflation and everything and, and how capital flows in this present economy. Thanks, Del. And one of the things we learned as the formation of the African American Alliance for CDFI CEOs was um, not, not a surprise, but, but it got documented was that um, the that CDFIs that are led by people of color have a more difficult time getting access to capital than CDFIs that are led by others. Correct. Uh, that's that's a that's a compounding factor, right? And so, um, and as the industry grows and there's a lot of um, resources coming in, making sure that it's really distributed in a way that's going to produce the results that we want as an industry, um, are are, um, are always a challenge and something we need to pay attention to. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Let's wrap up this one. We'll go we'll go to the audience. But um, Don, we'll have you go. In response to the mayor. Um, <clears throat> uh, we we know the mayor quite well, and we trust that this is a, an administration that is a listening administration and a collaborative administration. You know that changes from mayor to mayor. Some come in, um, and it is a, a one way dialogue of how you can help us. And what's wonderful about um, this mayor is we know that that dialogue will go both ways. Um, uh, not entirely solution-based, but collaborative-based. Um, we have uh, helped the city in a number of ways and, and stand ready to continue to do so. You know, uh, we have been an ad hoc uh, data advisor uh, to the city in a number of ways, whether it's a question comes up uh, around what is the impact of um, reverse mortgages in Philadelphia? What is the impact of foreclosures? What is the impact of evictions in Philadelphia? And we've stood ready to do those both on the on the fly, on the back of an envelope kind of uh, data studies, but also then uh, uh, deeper versions of that uh, when, when that's necessary and when there are resources for it. We also uh, have run some programs for the city that um, um, are essentially pilots, right? So while we run, a, and we ran a statewide, we run a nationwide food access program, we're also running a very small food justice program in Philadelphia that allows us to, to create eligibility and targeting uh, parameters that are very specific to what the city wants to get done. Uh, the particular areas they want to address or the particular uh, demographics or eligibility concerns they want to address. And um, we're, we're thrilled to do those kinds of micro or pilot examples of what's possible with a small amount of money. Um, um, and then, of course, we also are, are ready, like PIDC, with the kind of bigger gun resources that new markets can bring to bear or larger leverage to more signature projects that may get done. While we'll never be relevant to a stadium project, um, I hope, uh, we are very relevant to the kinds of uh, cornerstone projects that can become the anchor from which a whole lot of subsequent development hinges um, and continue to do those very significant, you know, multi, multi-million dollar projects that still don't get well received by conventional sources of financing that may still need substantial amounts of subsidy to, uh, to get to the finish line, but then trigger a, a ripple of effects through a neighborhood or a corridor. Um, our best example of that is the year after year after year after work that we did on North Broad Street. Um, some of the work that we did in West Philadelphia um, from Mantua all the way around to Southwest. Um, so big guns are available and capable of being aimed. We love doing pilots that demonstrate, uh, concepts 
and then we're there with data and analytics on the fly so that, so that legislation or aiming the city's resources can be more accurate. That's great, Don. I think it's interesting. All of your answers so far have spoken to the fact that the, 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 the description of what a CDFI does, its role as capital, doesn't describe all the things it really does and all the roles it plays in relationship to different partners. The city is a partner, but also uh, the private, uh, private sector is a partner and uh, the philanthropic side is, uh, is a partner. So it's really interesting. And Mike, you have the ability, you look at this from an outside view, right? You're, you, you know, you're, you're kind about Philadelphia and you're welcome to respond to the mayor of Philadelphia, but you see it from St. Paul, but you'll see it in other places as well as you look across your network. And I just wonder how you think about things that the, that Philadelphia needs to, Philadelphia CDFIs in the city need to be thinking about. Yeah, I absolutely would not presume to uh, know what Philadelphia needs to think about because you guys are uh, so far in front of uh, much of the industry. But the one thing I'll mention real quick is the uh, where a lot of our work and the model come together is on business incubators that present as public markets. So where so we have Midtown Global Market, Mercado Central in Minneapolis, uh, up in Syracuse. One of our members uh, opened up Salt City Market. Those are three examples you might want to take a look at. There are key intersections, high visibility locations in the heart of low-income neighborhoods, and they're filled with businesses that are continually trained, supported, financed um, by uh, whether it's a CDFI or the member of our organization. Um, and the, the space there is uh, long-term affordable for uh, those types of businesses uh, to start up in. And, and that's where I think, um, again, it's not a typical CDFI activity, but it's absolutely uh, the most powerful neighborhood revitalization um, stimulus that we've seen uh, come out of our program. Yeah, thanks, Mike. The, the uh, central market, I remember decades ago, right, was when it got started, played a really important role in sort of organizing the market for folks who otherwise wouldn't be able to have access to market. Um, and, and it's been really, really an important thing. So it's interesting to hear about other cities where that's happening. Um, let's turn, um, we're getting a, a more questions, I think, than we'll answer, so, but let's try um, from the from the audience. Um, one of the questions that I, I want to ask is, um, there's a question about um, how you set targets and visions for the impact, particularly the impact you want to have in a community. Um, how do you do that? How do you think about that? What are your current targets? And what have you learned, um, you know, in the process of doing that over all these years of experience that you all bring to, to this? And I'll see who wants to raise their hand first before I assign it. Anybody? Well, Mark, um, I'll take a stab. Okay. Um, this harkens back to a very old conversation I, I would either witness Jeremy having with many people or I would have with Jeremy, that to have intention and hold yourself accountable to the projected impact that you're designing in your program or a transaction is a little more virtuous than typical in our space. Our, our space tends to respond to these questions with outputs and square footage created, seats in a school or daycare center created, jobs permanently or temporarily created. And that's not really what you're asking, right? Um, the goal here is, uh, you know, for instance, in our, in our food program, we, we know how many people are too far from fresh food in a particular a catchment area. We can calculate how many people that distance should be cured for by financing a particular size store at a particular address. And then subsequently, we can redo that work to reconfirm that those projections became true. That's rare in our space, right? And I think one of the reasons it's rare is, for instance, you take another niche like affordable housing, and uh, you add up even all the efforts of a large loan fund like the reinvestment fund. We do not move the needle on the scale of the problem. So because we don't move the needle, we stop measuring the needle, unfortunately, right? So the people who do the needs assessment are completely different from the people who do the actions to address it. And those actions are minuscule compared to the problem. And it can make you feel like you're putting a cup of water in the Atlantic Ocean, right? Great project, great physical asset, great addition to a neighborhood, but the gross numbers in, in a county remain the same afterwards. And, and, and more recently, 
you know, you're also losing, you know, uh, water out of the tub in the sense that there's continuing units leaving affordability as you're making new units entering affordability. So sometimes I feel like we feel uh, smothered a bit by the need. And even though, you know, we're a very large loan fund, we are tiny as it relates to domestic policy problems like affordable housing, like employment in certain populations and certain geographies. And um, as a result, we all go back to counting outcomes. And we don't always count impact because nobody wants to say I financed a $9 million project and the stats remain the same afterwards. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you shouldn't finance it, right? These are capital infusions into place and asset creations and cultural institutions that need to be in place. But you may not have really moved the needle that much. What you're doing, though, is you're planting a flag and you're inspiring people to what's possible if only we could do a tremendous amount more. Don, I want to go, I just want to pick up on something you said about the fresh foods work that you did, which was pioneering and, and has led the nation um, in, into a, embracing that. It, it was sort of, I mean, to your point, it was sort of practice led, right? You knew there was a problem, you went out and did it. Then you began to be able to collect data around it um, and you began to be able to sort of scale it and scope it a little bit, right? So you could, you could respond to it. But it's a discrete thing in a sense relative to affordable housing, which is a much bigger multivariate complex thing. Um, that's much harder, as you said, to to um, to address. Anybody else want to look at that and talk about that question about targets, impact targets? Well, I was going to add that what Don is saying also connects to this discussion about data and the quality of data and actually kind of thinking about the work that Jeremy did in the early days around putting it on maps, making it accessible to people so everyone had the same starting point when looking at problems is something that I think we need to get back to. We need to get back to measuring data, defining data and measuring it in a way that not only helps the CDFIs target their work in line with a economic development strategy, but also helps us communicate that to partners. I think when CDFIs communicate what they do in terms of impact, we know what it means. But the bankers, the funders, the impact investors, the family offices, all of these groups that want to do impact, sometimes we're talking past each other. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of looking at what we're collecting, is what we're collecting meaningful? Is it meaningful enough to move the needle or at least meaningful enough to get others on board to help us move the needle? Is a bigger conversation about the role of data in CDFIs and in the industry and how we use that to leverage our resources with other outside partners. So it's almost a cost benefit sort of thing you have to decide each time you want to think about that that question, I think. That's mm-hmm. So let me, let me um, uh, Mike, there's a question that I think you might be able to be helpful with um, here. We, we, you know, we hear a lot about, um, about uh, new American or immigrant entrepreneurs, and we hear about informal, unregulated lending circles and that, that model of things. And I just wonder if you have any perspective on that and whether that's something that we want to encourage or the, that, that Philadelphia should be embracing um, or advancing. So, you know, in San Francisco, there's been an effort to create a structure around informal lending, you know, an infrastructure and an ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, it starts again with um, connecting with these folks and getting a trust going um, uh, with them. And if they're in those informal financing networks as a starting point, how do you get them up to the next rung of the ladder, which is uh, maybe with with, uh, your CDFIs or maybe with um, a training class or whatever. Um, They're doing these informal uh, networks on their own. They do it in the countries they come from. They do it within their own families uh, and their own friend networks. And so um, it's it's not an issue of, helping them do those as much as where do they go from there. And when they're coming from other countries, uh, particularly if it's the developing, a developing country, uh, helping them navigate um, all the regulations that Karen was talking about earlier, uh, uh, helping them figure out how to take a next step without, if with their business, without going to um, often a predatory lender of some sort. Uh, I think that's, that's what I would add here is, you want to be able to grab these folks uh, through trust and through cultural networks um, right away so that their next step is is a positive one for them. 
Yeah, the trust issue is enormous. Um, you know, every CDFI has to work really hard to earn trust and has to sort of earn it one transaction at a time if it's in a, you know, in a, in a, in involved with a sort of a new community or a different community. Um, that's really, um, that's a huge challenge. So thank you for reminding us that, Mike. Um, Adela, I want to come back to you. The um, I know I know because I've seen you at various impact investing events um, that you're plugged into this world of impact investing and um, let you start this off and others join. But but what does it mean? You know, how is that affecting you? Is that creating opportunity for you? Is that creating challenges for you? How do you how do you try and uh, you sort of work with the impact investing community? I think it has really changed our perspective on how we work with low wealth founders and CEOs, right? Who come to the table with uh, high aspiration, but low in assets and low in resources to achieve that aspiration. And in the past, we did have it from a debt lens perspective, right? Looking at that balance sheet, looking at their ability to pay. Whereas being now in the impact investment and equity world, it's really about how do you structure those aspirations toward a growth strategy, right? Developing an eye for the economy, learning how to understand what EBA does. So it really is, is, is helping the enterprise center come up with a narrative change, come up with a whole new strategy of how we approach our clients. Most times when we ask our clients to send their financial statements, they would only send the income statement. Very rarely would they send the balance sheet with it. Now we're focused on, you, you gotta send us the balance sheet. Right. And we're focused on that because we know that if you do not build that balance sheet where the enterprise value lies, there's no cashing out. There's no exit. There's no building more uh, capital on that balance sheet. So I think now being in the impact investing world, in the equity world, it's helping the enterprise center do a better job. That's great. That's great. Others, Jody, did you want to respond? Just that the, the the need to look at the impact on the business in terms of the products that we're offering um, is just as important as the impact that our actual dollars do. And I agree with Della in terms of having those conversations about the role of debt and equity for a small business. Um, we need to also continue to talk about grant support. Not all small businesses are going to be at the place where they can absorb or want to take on a, a large equity investment or a significant one, but they just need the grant capital to get up and running. And so one of the things we're looking at is how do we, with the debt cert products that we offer, because right now we do um, just offer different types of loan products, are there is there grant support to help some of the smaller growing small businesses get over the hurdle to be in a place where they'll have that stronger balance sheet to go to places like the enterprise center and have those conversations. And then there's also that, um, that capacity, that technical assistance side, the education piece to explain to them how all of this works and how this benefits them or how they may not be uh, ready for that and need to do some other things. So there's a lot that comes into thinking about the impact we have on the small business, just not the impact that our dollars are making when it comes to quality jobs created, you know, square footage developed and that sort of thing. Right. I, 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 I do okay. want to add, Mark, uh, not to just challenge a little bit about the grants, we have seen that if the grant conversation is not calibrated, as they grow, they're still looking for grants. I think that we need to convert grant into patient capital and stop using the word grants and start using the word inpatient capital because they're not able to understand the difference in the capital landscape, how grant is a short term just addresses a, a particular stage or cycle or condition. And that's never discussed. So I'm having larger business looking for a grant. And I, I don't think that it is done in such a way that people understand the difference. So I'm not against grants, but I, I like the word patient capital a lot better. Thank you, Della. I mean, I think that's something that is the CDFI industry has changed. It's had to learn to sort of deal with a whole range of types of capital and figure out what the appropriate way to do that was. Um, and, and not just to fixate on one type, but but to really figure out how to grow that in a healthy way, as you were talking about earlier. So we have many questions I'd like to ask, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to ask all of them. Um, but I do want to I do want to ask you as sort of the lightning round, um, I'm going to ask everybody to respond to this is, you know, what did you hear today that, that most excited you or most impressed you or seemed the most important thing to do? And what are your, you know, top of mind thoughts about what it takes to make it happen? Um, so who wants to jump in? 
I can start. Um, <laughs> one, two things that jumped out at me is the role for CDFIs in different stages of a small business or a client's development. And we all talked about a range of products um, from patient capital, debt, to equity, I, I agree with, with Della in terms of educating and supporting our, our small businesses and understanding what's out there for them, but also noting that different CDFIs bring different strengths and we all have a role on that capital continuum. Um, the other thing that jumped out at me is just kind of the flexibility of CDFIs to pivot into places, sectors, industries, as Don was noting, um, and to serve certain populations as, as Mike was noting. And there's a place for us because the need is so great and we have to keep our eye on the need um, of supporting our, our communities and, and how we all fit in there. So those are the two things that kind of jumped out at me. Great lead off, thank you. I'll jump in. I think my takeaway today, particularly hearing Don and, and uh, Jody speak is that uh, organizational capacity really matters. You cannot have you know data and do all these things if you yourself do not have organizational capacity. So my takeaway is that I think CDFIs need to focus, or they don't have to try to be all things to all people, but 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 build their organization capacity and know that strength and stay in that lane. But but we need to build more, more organizational capacity. And I'm really proud to be on this panel with Don and with Jody. Well, that's great, Della. What what do you think the city might do to help make that happen? I, as I said, you know, their funding cycle of the city doesn't align with this organization capacity because when you get a one year grant or one year opportunity, you know, and to report the data within that cycle, particularly if you work in a certain community, you won't have that data to report. On an aggregate basis, if you're a large organization, you might have more data, but a very small organization, you can't do that within the cycle of the funding. And so I think that we need to take a look at how we fund CDFIs. We really force us to compete rather than collaborate because it's a small amount of money. I just think the city really need to change the whole CDFI funding model. Thank you. Mike, Don, takeaways? Um, for, you know, there's been some great work in Pennsylvania around organizing CDFIs, and I think Philadelphia can advantage itself of that round table now that already exists. It's a place where we can skip past the competition phase, where we can decide who's the best fit and um, move forward quicker. So I think that's really important. Um, back to um, the commentary about grants are sometimes the solution to capitalizing a small enterprise. The new certification for CDFIs cuts directly against that. Uh, our grant making activities are no longer CDFI serving activities. Um, and if our mission is to serve nonprofits, they can't receive equity. You can't invest an equity instrument in a nonprofit. The equity instrument is a grant, but it's not seen as financing, even though we've spent a tremendous amount of work doing due diligence and underwriting to make sure we're picking the right organizations to invest scarce capital in. As soon as it's got a grant agreement attached to it, those hours spent and those dollars invested don't count on our CDFI mix. That's something that maybe Jody could help us with going back to her companions. <laughs> and for everybody else, it's really an unforeseen problem. Um, I get that when we all did PPP or when we did mass amounts of uh, grant relief, that wasn't really underwritten. That was emergency aid. And that's not a classic CDFI investing activity. But when we do an RFP for growing early childcare centers and 90% of them are nonprofit, and what we give them is a grant to grow. Uh, that takes the same work and the same skills as giving them a loan, but that money's permanent, um, and the loan is leverage, and uh, we'd like to be able to count both. So there are some structural issues to us being um, doing what's best, and I think um, we could use some help at the federal level to make sure we can do different things at the local level um, but I do think we have the round table now in Pennsylvania that Philadelphia could advantage itself of. That's great, thank you, Don. And I was just trying to interject that for those of you who aren't familiar with the inner workings of the CDFI fund certification process, first, you should be grateful. And second, um, this is a highly technical and hugely important issue. Mike, last, last response, and then I'll say some thank yous and we'll let everybody go. Mike. 
Uh, from a neighbor perspective, um, we we talk about areas of concentrated poverty need concentrated opportunity. Uh, so what can CDFIs do in Philly and anywhere else um, to at least have a portion of their work uh, focused on particular uh, low income neighborhoods? Who are their who are the right partners? What are the right tools? What's the right kind of loan capital? What's the right kind of underwriting? Is there a real estate uh, component to this that can create some long-term affordability? Um, and that's a different set of um, activities and partnerships than most CDFIs have had historically. But that's uh, the thing I wanted to leave with. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I want to suggest that if we can capture these questions, we might be able to create a Q&A and let each of the participants respond a little bit to some of the great questions that we weren't able to get to. But um, at this point, I need to say thank you. Thank you to our panelists, first of all, to to um, to Jody and Della and Mike and Don. And thank you to Don and the Reinvestment Fund for keeping Jeremy's um, thinking alive with us and his ideas and his inspiration alive with us. Um, so appreciate that. Um, to uh, Susan Wachter, who I hope was able to join eventually. I don't know if she was able to join, but Susan and the Penn Institute for Urban Research and Re uh, Research, um, thank you for, for hosting this and making it possible and supporting us in doing all of this. Special thanks to everybody who came and is part of our, our conversation today. Um, we You were great. You gave us lots of things to talk about, and I hope we can yet respond to some of the things we didn't get to. Um, thank you to uh, Mayor Parker and uh, to Karen on her behalf for bringing this forward to us and giving us a chance to engage. And I, I trust this is the beginning of a conversation that will involve not only CDFIs, but communities um, and um, and uh, the city and, and everybody who's, who cares about uh, the city. Um, so thank you, Karen. Appreciate you, you, you being part of that. Um, and uh, finally, um, thank you for spending your time with us. I think we're done. and. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.